Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's, I see it's time to start the uh, presentation. My name is uh, Frank Menders. Um, I work for Merino uh, Services. Uh, I've got the great honor to, uh, today to present uh, to you uh, info EAPLN and in specific uh, the uh, line assembly control uh, module. Um, uh, I say we wait for, a, for another minute to see if more people who accepted the invitation uh, will uh, join us. So please uh, bear with us uh, for another minute uh, to give also the other people uh, the chance to, uh, to join the presentation. Uh, during the presentation, if there is uh, anything you would like to ask or comment, uh, uh, please do not hesitate and uh, put it in the in the chat box, uh, so you can uh, uh, can reach me with the with the with the chat uh, functionality of the WebEx uh, presentation, um, and I will absolutely uh, come back uh, to you. Um, uh, thank you all for joining uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, like I said, this will be a presentation on uh, line assembly control in uh, EAPLN. Uh, before we start with uh, line assembly control, I will give you a very short introduction on uh, Merino uh, services, uh, who we are and uh, what we do. So let me kick off uh, with, uh, with, uh, with that. Um, we are uh, Merino services. Uh, we are a company headquartered in New Delhi in India and with a European uh, office in, uh, in the Netherlands, um, uh, a broad base of consultants uh, in, uh, in, in Europe working on, uh, uh, on European uh, projects uh, for INFOR uh, uh, EAPLN. Um, we are a global company, not only uh, uh, with an office in uh, the Netherlands for Europe, but also with an office in Florida for the US and in Kuala Lumpur and in China and in Dubai. Um, we are an Infor shop only. That means uh, we only do uh, Infor uh, products. And uh, these, the industries that we focus upon, the industries that we serve are also the industries where Infor focuses. Um, when you look at Merino and specifically with the, um, with the functionality that we will discuss today, uh, we focus on, uh, on automotive, on high-tech electronics, and on uh, uh, machinery, machinery and equipment uh, manufacturing. Um, but I will explain that uh, later. We also have other uh, areas where we focus, but uh, wherever we focus, be it textile, be it distribution, be it wiring cable, it is always with the Infor products. Um, like I said, we have a global presence, the Netherlands, uh, Dubai, uh, India, uh, China, uh, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, and uh, the US. And um, yeah, th this is how we serve basically global customers, uh, customers who roll out EAPLN or one of the other info products to all their sites and facilities around the globe. And this is how we support those customers. Um, Let me just scroll through this because we have a lot of work to do actually when we uh, when we come to assembly control. Uh, it will be uh, a pretty heavy uh, presentations uh, from a slight uh, perspective uh, on uh, assembly control. Um, so yeah, like I said, my name is Frank Menders, um, and and I will have the honor to uh, present uh, assembly control to you. So before we start. With assembly control, let me first position it. Uh, let, let us have a look where we uh, where we position assembly control because most of the people using EAPLN are familiar with uh, the shop floor control module. Uh, most of the people uh, know uh, job shop or shop floor control uh, uh, SFC in EAPLN. Uh, also, a lot of people would know uh, the project based manufacturing in EAPLN. But it's already a, a, a fewer uh, uh, people who would be aware of the repetitive uh, manufacturing modules and the assembly control uh, modules. And that is a pity, uh, because also assembly control is a very strong module in EAPLN. And we position it basically in an area where um, we have a high process standardization. So there's a strong focus on process uh, and where there is 
a low product standardization. So basically, what does that mean? It means that the products that are being produced uh, are all pretty unique, eh? one by one pretty unique, eh? or with at least uh, some uh, specific uh, configurations that are linked to a certain customer. And the process is extremely optimized, lean and standardized. Eh? So that is basically the area, the quadrant where we focus assembly control upon. Um, I want to highlight a little bit the difference of assembly control, ASC, uh, the assembly control differences with uh, SFC. Uh, and I know that some of the things that we do, that I mentioned here for assembly control, are also applicable to uh, SFC. But I still believe it is important to, uh, uh, to highlight it. Uh, when we look at assembly control, like I uh, already mentioned, uh, assembly control is basically one by one flow production. Uh, so where every product is more or less unique, uh, at least considered unique, uh, where there's a strong focus on the process. Uh, and another important thing is where product and uh, process are integrated, uh, more stronger than with SFC. Also, uh, a, a typical, typical characteristics of assembly control is that uh, sequencing, uh, uh, advanced sequencing is, 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 is required. Also, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, trying to minimize uh, inventory and to make sure that inventory is supplied into the line uh, in the last minute uh, and exactly at the right time uh, for the right product is, an, is a characteristic of assembly control. When we look at SFC, uh, I would call that more like batch production. Uh, we produce uh, uh, batches of the same products, uh, basically. It's a looser process control uh, because we have a routing. Uh, that's how we control the process. But the routing is not really mandatory. And, and very often, um, well, it is mandatory, obviously, but not, not a lot of operations uh, are mandatory. I've seen people producing with SFC with only two routing operations, like start production and end production. Uh, and that's not what we would call a uh, strong process uh, control. In SFC, you get a lot of flexibility. Uh, and, and all the things are everything, all the transactions basically are done by the production order. Production order. Uh, we have production order costing and uh, uh, we do the, uh, all the reporting uh, by operation, uh, by order. Uh, we have assembly control. We have the options not to work in an, in an, in an order-based mode. Uh, uh, let's say all the transactions recorded by the order. But we have the option to work by line, uh, by, by, by line station or by line, uh, where we do the costing by line, uh, where we do all the transactions by line station. Uh, so there are pretty big differences between assembly control and SFC. And in this presentation, we'll, uh, we'll focus on those differences. We'll tell you, you know, what the differences are and why we have these differences. First, some characteristics about uh, line assembly. Uh, so just to make sure that everybody is on the same page when we talk about uh, line assembly. So uh, when we talk about line assembly, we're we'll talking about an assembly line where the, the finished good, uh, the, the to be finished good, moves uh, from one station to another. Uh, so the finished good is being pulled uh, on a belt or something, you know, from one station uh, to another station. And in the stations, uh, we execute the work. So every line station executes his specific work. It's always the same work that the station executes. Uh, so it's very clear and it's very lean, it's very optimized. Uh, the, the, people in the, line, the people in the line station know exactly what to do, when to, and, and how to do it. Uh, and it will not change. The raw materials are brought in uh, to the line stations just in time and also obviously just in sequence. Uh, so the, 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 the raw material that is brought into the line fits exactly the, uh, the product that is being assembled at that moment and that station. Huh? The other, uh, the other uh, characteristic is that the line moves in a so-called tuck time. Uh, it moves with a constant speed. And even in a mixed line, uh, so even in a line where different pro products are being assembled, it moves with one tuck time. Uh, it, it, it moves with one speed the finish uh, uh, at the end. The benefits of assembly control, the benefits of assembly line production in general, are basically very much related to what we have learned from lean manufacturing. Uh, it's all about producing faster, less labor, 
very process oriented, very pool based, obviously, uh, eliminating waste, uh, putting operations very close to each other, optimizing the operations in the, in the most uh, lean uh, way uh, to uh, eliminate waste, of course. Uh, um, a strong focus on first time right and um, uh, trying at least with the assembly line to create the perfect value flow uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to create the, the most optimal flow to assemble to assemble a finished good. What are the drivers for assembly control? You know what 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 drives companies to move from from um, uh, from one production methodology to, to assembly control. Uh, the most important uh, reasons are given here on the slide. Uh, when, we, um, uh, when we produce cars or, or, or uh, planes uh, or trains, uh, they're, they're very large. Uh, and the, the, the most optimal way to produce those, uh, those products is basically to move them on a line from one station to another. So, uh, so value can be added in every, uh, in every station. Uh, where it is very important that we synchronize uh, the operations, the materials, uh, other companies, uh, you know, uh, subsidiary companies and, 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 and suppliers, uh, that we have an extreme control uh, about how everybody uh, works at the same time, delivering to the same, to the same product just in time. Also, how we uh, replenish the material uh, to, to the, uh, uh, the supply systems, how we uh, replenish uh, raw material to the line. That, uh, that, that is uh, better controlled with, uh, with line, uh, line assembly control. So, in short, efficiency, speed, control, standardization, cost control, and mass customization basically drive uh, people to to, to implement uh, the uh, uh, the assembly line, uh, the, the pictures the pictures that you see in this presentation are taken from uh, from Ford and from Nissan. Uh, obviously, I mean I think everybody will know that that Ford <coughs> in, invented uh, the uh, the uh, assembly line uh, uh, 100 years uh, ago, and um, uh, the principle uh, is exactly still the same uh, when we look at the line assembly uh, uh, pictures. Uh, so this is uh, uh, this is a Ford assembly line uh, um, uh, in the early days, and basically what you see here to the, uh, what you see here in this picture, uh, it, it is uh, you will recognize uh, the lines of uh, today. Okay, today maybe we got more robots, uh, but still um, uh, 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 a big part of the work on the assembly line is done by people as well. Uh, and this is a very modern picture. This is a picture from uh, from today, uh, basically coming from the uh, Nissan uh, site in uh, Brazil. Uh, and, uh, and this is yeah, uh, th th this is exactly how we uh, 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 the, the, the same concept as as Ford introduced it. So, what do we build with EOPLN uh, uh, assembly control? And I'm saying EOPLN assembly control. Uh, so what? Does info support at the moment uh, with EOP uh, uh, assembly control? Uh, basically, the build, the assembly of planes, yachts, uh, boats. Uh, I mean, I was surprised when I heard it for the first time, but it's really true. Uh, so we buy, uh, we build planes, yachts, cars, fire trucks, and trains with EOPL and uh, assembly control. And I know that there are people on the call who would say, I know something more is being built with assembly control, and that's fine. Uh, you can uh, you can imagine what else uh, we can build on an assembly line. Um, so, what are the characteristics? What are the characteristics of uh, assembly control in EAPLN? Um, we position assembly control as uh, as a production methodology. Uh, it is assembly. It's a production methodology, as I already explained. It fits in the, in the in the heart of EAPLN, and it is compatible. It links to other modules, obviously, but also to shop floor control. Uh, when we have assembly line uh, production, uh, when we have assembly line uh, uh, flow, some of the parts that are being uh, supplied to the line for assembly can be produced in-house or in another plant with shop floor control. Uh, 
not all the parts are being being purchased and coming from external suppliers. Uh, so some parts, and uh, this is how assembly control links to shop floor control, uh, where some of the parts that we use in the assembly line are being produced with shop floor control. Assembly control links to the order entry, order configuration, so we're talking about sales orders. Uh, with the demand that we use for assembly line uh, manufacturing is the demand that we get from uh, from order and uh, from sales orders, and the sales orders link to the configuration, uh, to the PCF or to the uh, external uh, configurator uh, of Infor. Uh, so we have two ways of configuring our sales orders, and 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 the products from the sales orders are the demand uh, as input for the assembly planning. The um, the assembly line also links to warehousing has a very strong link with warehousing for the replenishment, obviously also for the shipping, the invoicing, and the, the aftermarket and dealer management. Looking in detail, all the different, uh, uh, the different processes uh, for assembly control as we have it in LN, there will picture like this. Uh, so where we have dealers, trade houses, uh, the sales organization that creates uh, 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 product configurations, product orders, uh, the orders are the input for uh, for assembly planning. Um, from assembly planning, uh, we get the requirements for the enterprise plan planning, MRP. Uh, we run the MRP for the lower level parts, uh, basically. Um, that, that enterprise planning inputs to purchasing, obviously, to shop floor control, uh, the the, 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 the parts uh, that are being received in the warehouse will be replenished uh, to the uh, assembly line. In assembly line itself, we've got a, a, a sequencing, a scheduling engine uh, to do the uh, uh, assembly line uh, sequencing. It links to freight management, obviously, uh, when we ship uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, our customers, uh, we can use uh, freight management. There is a strong link to finance and there is a link to the quality management uh, system in, uh, in, uh, in ERPLN. Um, when we look at an assembly line, uh, I mean, this is a very simplistic uh, picture of an assembly line. What we see in this picture that we have a main line and a supply line. Uh, every line has a couple of segments. Uh, that is the circle, uh, we call that a segment in the line. And in a segment, you've got a buffer and you've got line stations. Uh, so if I explain this picture with an example, then for instance you see here the Merino engine line eh, that supplies the Merino main line. What do I assemble on this line? As you can see from the segments, I'm probably assembling a car here. Eh? So I'm, I'm producing a car, I've got a lot of different segments and I organize the segments on the line based on the product group. So I've got the chassis, I've got the excellent tires, I got the engine assembly, I got the gearbox, the radiator, the seats, electrical, and so on and so on. And in total, I've got I think I've got 13 segments in a car, uh, uh, in, in a typical car uh, assembly. And you see here that the engine line, uh, where we have the engine build and the engine test buffer uh, uh, segment, link into the engine line assembly of the main line. So the Merino engine line, uh, that could be an assembly line in a different plant. Could be in the same plant as the main line. Could also be in a different, completely different plant. Uh, so this model is uh, multi-company, uh, multi-company by nature. Okay. So this is literally the picture of that you see in the factory on how to assemble a car or a plane or a boat. Uh, and um, so in EAPLN, you will also have to set up this exact picture. So if you keep this picture in mind, the Merino engine line and the Merino main line, and you see the segments and you see the buffers and the stations, then in EAPLN it would look like this. I hope that it is visible. Uh, please do make the screen big, uh, um, you know, make this picture big on your screen so you can see the details. Um, what we have is... Uh, And I hope that my yeah. uh, we we have the assembly line. Um, 
uh, we, we have an, uh, an, an, an assembly line. Uh, first, we set up the assembly line in EAPLN. You see the Merino main line, and you see the Merino engine line. Inside the, like the main line, we set up all the different segments. Uh, we set up number one is the chassis segment, and the next line segment is the excellent tire segment. So you really make the chain in EAPLN. Uh, you, make the, you make the complete chain of segments of how the flow in uh, on the assembly line uh, uh, goes. When you look at the, uh, the segments, uh, now I'm going by segment, uh, you see the line stations. Uh, and for instance, here you see uh, we are looking at the gearbox assembly, and you see the station is MB4. Uh, it goes into number 4, uh, goes into MLG1. Um, uh, so all the line stations, all the different line stations, work centers, uh, are linked to segments. So in assembly line control, you get two types of work centers. Uh, we have work centers where we execute the work, work centers where we do something, uh, where we add something to the finished good, and we got so-called buffers. We have buffers, and buffers could be compared to small warehouses. Uh, so between every segment, in between of every segment, I've got a buffer, and that buffer, like I said, it's a mini warehouse. And why do I have that? That is what the system uses to re resequence orders in the line. Uh, so, for instance, uh, uh, when I when I'm building a, a couple of different uh, cars, uh, and after one segment, I want to change the sequence of how I assemble the car. So I want to uh, I want to put all the automatic gearboxes uh, uh, together, for instance. Uh, so I can change the sequence of the assembly line in a so-called buffer. Uh, so to, to facilitate that, I have two types of, uh, of work centers, of assembly stations. Um, uh, the, the buffer and the, uh, uh, and the work center. So to every, every assembly station, I link an operation. Uh, and we do that in so-called assignments. Uh, so to every work center, to every workstation, uh, we link one or two operations. So that is the uh, whole chain in EAPLN. So when we take back this picture, uh, if we draw it like this, this is literally what we build in EAPLN to facilitate the process. And this is also what I mean with a strong process control. Uh, uh, this is different from shop floor control, different from, different from the normal production orders. Uh, with the normal shop floor control, I, I don't need to model uh, the, the whole layout of the factory in, uh, in EAPLN. And with assembly control, basically, that's what you do. You model the layout of the factory, uh, of the flow, basically, in EAPLN. Uh, looking with assembly line, segments, stations, operations. And when every line has a tech time, uh, the line has a speed in which it uh, pulls, uh, in which it flows, Every station has its own cycle time. You know, that means how long does the work take that is being executed in that uh, station. When we look at the engineering, and I call it engineering in general, uh, we see how the process will be linked to the product. Uh, because when we look at the engineering, we do have product uh, engineering, but we also have process engineering. First of all, let me explain a little bit of a typical assembly product that we assemble on an assembly line. The product, like a car or a plane eh, or a train, but let's take a simple car, eh, because I'm working here in my system with the Merino uh, car, the Merino family car, uh, model 2017. Eh, the, the, top level, uh, uh, the top level item is, uh, is the car itself that I sell. Eh? So the top level item in the bill of material is my sellable item. That is a configured item. Uh, so the Merino car, uh, the Merino family car 2017 is a configured item in EAPLN because every customer, uh, I'm offering to every customer to configure it in his way. He can choose the color, can be black or white, uh, he can cho choose the type of transmission, he can choose the engine, he can choose uh, the sunroof. Uh, so I've got a couple of options that he can uh, uh, choose. That's how I configure every car uniquely for my customer. So that's why I have a generic bomb, 
uh, PC, the Think PCF, Think uh, the external uh, CPQ configurator, uh, Think uh, configuration. That's how I structure my uh, my car in ERPLN. That is required in ERPLN for assembly control. Every assembled item in assembly control is a configured item. Uh, so I got my generic bill of material, and below my generic bill of material, uh, so below my uh, options and uh, and uh, uh, bomb options, I've got uh, engineering modules, so-called engineering modules, and I got assembly parts. Uh, so in this picture, the white circles are uh, engineering modules, and the red uh, circles are uh, assembly parts. The assembly parts are the parts that are being replenished into the assembly line. So the red parts that you see in this picture, uh, all the bolts that are red, are being supplied into the assembly line, and these are the parts that I use to build my Merino car. Everything below the assembly part, uh, everything below the red parts, the yellow parts, are just normal, standard, old-fashioned bomb items, uh, like we know them from uh, shop floor control. Uh, so all the yellow stuff, um, um, uh, all the red and the yellow stuff is being planned with enterprise planning. Uh, it is very important to understand that above the red parts, uh, so my engineering modules, which you could best compare to phantoms in a way, uh, they are there to structure the bill of material in an organizational, I would say in an, in, in, in uh, to, you know, uh, just for organi organization uh, uh, purposes uh, or for, for management purposes. Um, uh, all the above is uh, planned only with assembly control and only the standard bill of material is being planned with uh, enterprise planning. That is very important uh, to, uh, uh, to mention. So, when I look at my at my bill of material, uh, I got my top level item that is ordered on a sales order, uh, that is my car. Then I've got my engineering modules, and below my engineering modules, I got components. Uh, and those components, as you see in this picture, are being uh, the assembly parts, are being linked to operations. They have to be linked to operations. Uh, so or, or to work center. So it is different from shop floor control, job shop, uh, where you can uh, issue the entire bill of material, you know, the estimated materials, you can issue them at once before the order starts, uh, or you can back flush everything without linking it to an operation. In assembly control, you have to link every part to the work center, uh, to the operation, the work center, where is the component uh, required. Uh, you need to tell in, in, in this bill of material, the assembly bill of material, you need exactly to explain, Ellen, where do I need this part? So, a typical engineering flow will look like uh, the normal engineering work. Uh, we engineer parts, we engineer uh, products, we engineer bill of materials, uh, we have revisions uh, and all that good stuff, uh, and we finalize it. I think everybody knows this part. Uh, because many people use that, or the same thing with job shop or shop for control. Uh, and after that, we have to set up the item details. Think uh, item production data, item ordering data, item uh, uh, item costing data, item data by warehouse. Uh, that is the set of item details uh, part that we need to do for every item. All that is pretty standard. Uh, that is exactly as you would probably use today. Uh, the same thing would be uh, is applicable in assembly control. The next step, step in the engineering flow would be to create what I call the sellable item, the car, uh, the top level item. Uh, I need to create that and I need to set up the structure for that car. Uh, define the features, create a generic bomb, and then complete the assembly bomb. Uh, create the assembly parts, uh, and obviously below the assembly parts you have the normal uh, components uh, to build the assembly parts. That's also where the assembly line process engineering kicks in. Uh, the one yellow box goes into the other yellow box, because when we complete the assembly bomb, as I already mentioned, we need to tell EAPLN exactly where do we use the parts in the assembly line. And then, after that, uh, we need to set up the supply system. How do we supply the parts 
uh, to the assembly line. Uh, do we do it by Kanban, you know, empty bin for a full bin? Do we do it uh, in sequence, you know, where we pull racks into the uh, uh, into the assembly line? Or do we not do it by ourselves, but do we ask a supplier uh, or subcontractor to suppliers in the line uh, 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 directly? Uh, so that is what I mean with setting up the supply systems. All this need to be set up, uh, need to be configured in the system before you can use assembly control. So remember, the line setup, you need to create a line, uh, line segments, stations, buffers, uh, operations, assignments, and you need to set that up. Then you need to create the product, basically, create the whole product engineering, the whole product structure, and then you need to marry them together. And this also means that an assembled end item is linked to one assembly line. Yeah? So the Merino, uh, the Merino family car, uh, 2017 is linked to the Merino main line. Uh, so it's very clear from day one where the Merino family car is being assembled. So putting this in pictures, uh, what I just said in the first picture, the first picture you see the Merino uh, family car linked to the assembly line. Uh, so that is basically the whole car. The engineering module, when I look at the uh, engineering module, that describes, for instance, the axles. And then when I have an assembly part, when I have an assembly part, that is the uh, front uh, drive axle, for instance, uh, that is uh, linked to an operation linked to an assembly line and linked to a line station. Yeah. So in the bill of material where you go from the top level item, yeah, you go from the top level item, the Merino family car, to the engineering module below it, to the assembly part. Yeah. That is how the bill of material is, is structured. And this is also how you see how strong it is connected to the assembly line. Yeah over here on the part and over here on the main item. Okay, so that is product and process engineering. So when I have done that, uh, when I have my, I've got my beautiful car, I've got my beautiful Merino family car 2017, I got my beautiful line set up uh, uh, in the way I want, then I'm going to put demand in my system. Uh, and let's see if we can build a family car. Um, for that, I create a sales order. And in this example, I'm just using sales orders. Uh, I know that there is, there, is, there, there, there is another way of adding demand in uh, assembly control, and that is what we call so-called pseudo, uh, pseudo orders. And maybe in the future, there will even maybe be more ways of putting demand in. But for now, I focus on mainstream, you know, generic assembly control where we put in sales orders to create a demand for the assembly line. So just a normal assembly order and as the item I put in the Merino car in 2017, immediately the, uh, and I'm using here PCF, I'm using here the old-fashioned ERPLN uh, configurator, uh, immediately the question pops up, do you want to configure your family car? And I answer, yes, I would love to configure my family car. And it gives me the questions, what engine do you require? What color do you want? Uh, what gearbox uh, would you like on your, uh, on your family car? Uh, and this is, again, uh, this is standard functionality, standard functionality that many people of you already, probably already know. Standard sales order, standard configurator. After that, uh, from, the, from the sales order, you can drill down and see the details. Uh, you can see the multi-level generic bomb of the item. Uh, so you see the family car, you see the engineering module, and you see the, um, uh, the part and, and how it is linked, linked to operation one. And you see that actually the part, uh, the, uh, uh, the axle that we uh, supply into the assembly line is actually a manufactured item in this case. Uh, you see that the part that we supply into the line is a manufactured item with 
job shop uh, uh, supply source. So the part that we supply into the assembly line in this situation is produced on the shop floor control order somewhere else. Eh? I mean, in the plant or some other plant. Eh? But this is what I meant earlier when I said that uh, assembly control can be supplied from SFC, from job shop. So also when we look in the assembly line, uh, when we look in the assembly module in ERPLN, um, I can see uh, how the sales order links to the assembly line, but when I go back to assembly control in ERPLN, I can see how uh, the way back, how um, the assembly uh, control module links into the, um, to the sales order module. Uh, and from there in this screen, uh, when I open the session product variance inventory, I see uh, for the item all the orders and I see all the possible product variants. Uh, that uh, have been generated uh, for the demand and that is being assembled. So based on the demand, uh, based on the sales order, we are running a session or it runs in a job, generate the assembly orders. Uh, so please note that there is no enterprise planning kicking in here uh, in my example, in the picture that I draw here. There is no enterprise planning kicking in. It is demand and we run a session on top of that. Uh, generate assembly orders that creates the assembly orders. Uh, that is the flow in assembly control. So that is different from job shop. So when we have create the assembly orders with that session that I showed, the next step in the process would be to sequence assembly orders. Okay? And I'm starting here to talk about sequencing before I start talking about orders. And bear with me, I will come back on sequencing once I start talking about orders a little bit later on. Uh, but for now, the principle of sequencing, let me explain that. Inside ERPLN assembly control, you do not require another tool. There is no need for another sequencing or scheduling tool or whatever and what have you. ERPLN is perfectly capable of doing the sequencing of assembly orders, uh, line station orders. Um, uh, for the uh, for the assembly line. So for every segment, uh, for every segment of your assembly line, you can create rules. Uh, you can create sequencing rules. And I think you can already imagine why I say for every segment you can create uh, 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 sequencing rules or line rules. That is because of the fact that I already told you earlier. You know. Uh, you could resequence between segments. Uh, you could change the sequence between segments of your assembly line. Uh, keep in mind that a car manufacturing uh, or a car assembly line could be, you know, extremely long, very, very long. Uh, so from that perspective, it makes sense to be able to uh, uh, to allow you to resequence uh, the, the the flow of your assembly. So the sequencing, when we do the sequencing, so that basically means putting all the all the orders in the right order, eh? putting all the order, all the orders in the right sequence uh, according to well, according to what? Well, of course, according to your eh, possibly to your demand. Eh? Let's put them in the right order based on the customer demand. Maybe maybe that's a good idea, but maybe you also have an, a requirement to sequence the orders based on your. Uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the product specifics, uh, like I want to have all the black cars together, or I want to have all the automatic uh, gearboxes uh, together, or I want all the, all the light motorbikes together, uh, or something like that. Uh, you can imagine why you would like to you know, sequence orders in a certain uh, way. Or maybe it's capacity. Uh, maybe you have limited capacity and you say, I can do only one family car uh, per day with uh, you know with all the possible options yeah? so if i have orders on the same day uh, for two times a car with all the options yeah, because of the line rules yeah, it will prevent me to sequence two of those complete uh, cars in one day yeah? so the types that we have uh, the different types of sequencing rules that we have are priority a priority that is based on the fact if the, you know what is the customer required date and if an order has an or if a car has an owner 
you know, if, if it's a pseudo order or a real order, that makes a difference for the priority. We have clustering rules where we can say, okay, like in this example, you see that the gearbox sequencing is based on clustering. So we say all the automatic gearboxes need to come together. Or we got blocking rules. Huh? And here we have an option for the color where we say, okay, uh, white cannot, white cars cannot come after the black cars, for instance. Uh, that is, uh, that we prevent that because of contamination or stuff like that. And then we have a capacity restriction. Uh, what I just mentioned, I can only do one, uh, one full-blown family car per day. Uh, all, the, all the other cars need to be light cars. Uh, just an example of how you can use the different types, uh, the different rule types in EAPLN to sequence every segment uh, and, and with that to, to sequence the entire assembly line. Okay, so we have to create those rules uh, as sequencing for later on when we have the assembly orders uh, that we sequence in them, sequence them uh, to start the actual flow. Sequencing is a mandatory step in the system in assembly control to, uh, to do that. When you look at my picture, um, when you look at my picture from a process flow, and this is just an example of a process flow. I mean, this is uh, something that you will find in EAPLN. And of course, this obviously can be modified because this is just them. Huh? I mean, uh, but it gives you an idea of how a typical flow would uh, work in production. Uh, so uh, you would review the demand, basically. So what are the sales orders? What are the orders? What are the customer requirements? Uh, so let's see what we have to produce for the coming week, for instance. And then let's check what we have currently running on the assembly line. Yeah, what do we have currently? Uh, what sequence do we have? Yeah, so uh, how capable are we to fit in new orders? Yeah. Then we do the assembly line planning. That is basically creating for all the new assembly orders that we have. We have to create uh, assembly demand yeah, so that we can yeah, so that we can help enterprise planning. I have to plan for the lower level materials. Remember, shop floor control, purchased parts, all that need to be planned by enterprise uh, planning, uh, the MRP plan, if you would like. Uh, so that is, it gets its input from the, it gets the input from the assembly line planning. After that, we schedule the assembly orders. Uh, we sequence the assembly orders. We have an option to re-sequence if we want. We allocate the material to the assembly line and we freeze the assembly orders and then we start producing. And then we start assembling the orders. Looking at the sequencing engine, I already told you uh, the sequencing engine is uh, standard in EAPLN and it creates uh, sequence options. Uh, it creates, it, why is it called simulate? Because it creates line sequences. Uh, multiple different sequences that we can evaluate. Uh, we can evaluate the different options uh, that um, uh, that EAPLN will create for us, and it will give us an idea about the quality of the sequence. It means how good is the sequence created, the line sequence created by EAPLN. When when I like uh, when I like the sequence created by LN uh, and it is convertible, so EAPLN can convert it uh, to a real line sequence, then I can confirm confirm the line sequence and it will be uh, uh, it will be active. It can be executed. So like I said, when we have the assembly orders uh, based on demand, we have all the assembly orders. What should I do? I should make sure that I have the right material, that I have all the material available to produce uh, the car. So in order to have a super duper fast MRP, basically, uh, to, in order to make sure that I've got a super duper fast enterprise planning uh, to plan my lower level materials, I pre-process, basically, the assembly demand by running a session called Calculate Assembly Part Requirements. So what I'm doing is, based on all my assembly orders uh, and all their bill of materials, I run this session Calculate Assembly Part Requirements. This session creates a full list of assembly parts with the required dates, and that list is being passed over to Enterprise Planning. So Enterprise Planning does not run on my assembly orders uh, and my full bill of materials. It runs 
on the prepared list of assembly parts by planning time, uh, by planning bucket. Uh, so that makes it possible that enterprise planning runs extremely fast. Uh, you can see from this that the whole module is developed for speed. Uh, it is all developed for speed and for fast processing of, uh, of planning. Um, so a little bit of an explanation to what is uh, planned by MRP or by enterprise planning, uh, I should say, and what is planned by assembly control. So you can see that the top level, uh, the, the top level of my bill of material is basically, yeah, that's my generic options, uh, that, that, that is all my uh, options and features and my engineering modules. Then the assembly parts are being calculated by the assembly part requirements calculation, so not enterprise planning. And the generate order planning, uh, enterprise planning, generate order planning is uh, taking care of the shop floor, shop floor control orders, the purchase orders, the distribution orders, and all that uh, good uh, stuff. Okay. Um, now that we understand all the concepts, uh, I can explain you a little bit about the order management in in assembly control, because also the um, assembly orders themselves on the shop floor on the assembly line yeah, on the assembly line are very different from what you know from the shop floor orders yeah. first of all let's bring back what we already discussed we have a sales order we have a product variant and from that we create we create assembly orders yeah. so that is the flow sales order assembly order when I have the assembly order, the assembly order is split in so-called line station orders. And every line station order has a line station variant. And the reason to do that is to, again, optimize uh, all the transaction handling. Uh, think, uh, think material issuing, think back flushing. Uh, uh, so, in order to optimize that, we split all the possible assembly orders that we have, all the assembly orders, we split them in line station orders. So what we ask the people in the uh, line station to do is not to work on an assembly order. The people in the, in the, uh, on a line station, uh, on a work center, the people work on a group of line station orders uh, because they don't need to know the assembly order because they only need to focus on the wor work that they are specialized in uh, the work that they have to do. Uh, if they work on the gearbox, the only thing they have to do is work on or uh, assemble gearboxes. So all the work that they get on their list, uh, the entire list of work on this work center for the gearbox will be all gearbox work. Uh, and um, that is how it is, uh, uh, how the work is being divided over the assembly line. And when I have a group of line station orders for the gearbox, you can imagine that the line station variant attached to it, uh, which is basically giving me the parts and the operations, is only uh, gearbox parts. Uh, and it's only gearbox operations. Uh, what I have to do for an automatic gearbox and what do I have to do for another type? Uh, you can hear I'm not an expert in gearboxes, but I think you get the idea. Uh, so everything is optimized for the work in that specific workstation. Uh, so keep in mind, assembly orders have been split in line station orders, and the line station orders have line station variants uh, in which you can see the assembly parts and operations. This is also very important because different from shop floor control, with assembly con control, you can work in a so-called uh, line station mode, uh, uh, line station mode or line mode, uh, where you will not do your transactions by every order, uh, and all, but keep in mind also your costing will not be done by order, but it will be done by, by uh, assembly line. Uh, so the costing will be done by assembly line and also things like back flushing will be done for a group of um, uh, line station orders uh, in, in, in one go. And why do we do this? Everything to make sure that the enormous amount, uh, the enormous volume of transactions can be handled in the shortest possible time. Uh, I mean, we had examples, uh, we know of experiences in the past where 
some people, some manufacturers in automotive using shock flow control have issues with the performance uh, while back flushing. Uh, in order to uh, to prevent those uh, capacity problems, uh, the performance problems, uh, Info came up with line station orders and the concept of line station variants and the concept of clustered line station orders. Uh, so all this, uh, where an assembly, where different assembly control orders are being split in line station orders with line station variants, uh, it is all done to, uh, as they say here, reduce storage and uh, reduce uh, transactions uh, to optimize speed uh, for back flushing and for uh, for transaction handling. Okay. And from a concept, uh, how we do it in reality in an assembly line, it makes perfect sense. So, how, how does that look in EAPLN? Uh, and I'm just giving you this screen. This is not a screen that you would use a lot because you would see the line station orders by assembly line station uh, because there it makes more sense. But this picture, this picture is only to uh, uh, this picture is only to show you. Um, this picture is only to show you that one assembly line, uh, one assembly order. Uh, this is literally one assembly order that has been split in all these. Um, and all these line station orders. Uh, so you see a lot of line station orders. And you see the attached, uh, sorry, uh, you see the attached line station variant, uh, the line station variant that is attached, and you see if the assembly parts are being allocated to that uh, activity. So, if you got 100 line stations in your uh, in your assembly line, you will get 100 line station orders. In principle, uh, in my situation, for one assembly order. Uh, so every line station order is linked to its own line station variant. At least that is in the order based scenario because assembly control can work in a by order model. Uh, or if you see in my last paragraph, every line station. Uh, uh, order is linked to its uh, uh, own line, or every line station is linked to its own line station variant for a group of orders uh, in the line station based scenario. Okay, that's where we do not keep track on the orders, but just run transactions by line and also the costing by line. Okay, so that is a big difference uh, from uh, uh, from SFC. And keep in mind, this is all done uh, to optimize speed, to optimize performance, uh, and to optimize efficiency. Uh, and flow in the assembly line. Another thing is, um, um, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the process, the so-called process triggers. Uh, I mean, like in shop flow control, every um, every operation need to be finished, and uh, every operation uh, need to be completed. Uh, so, how do we do that uh, in an uh, assembly line? Well, there are different ways of doing that. There is the automatic closure, the automatic closure of the operation. There's obviously also scanning, and there is obviously the way to do it manually. Close the report, the operation completed, if you like. It's called a little bit different, but the same principle. But because everything is so fast and everything needs to go so fast and optimized for flow, eh, so we, what we can do is we develop process triggers where we can say if the work on one uh, operation started eh, or if one line station order is completed, kick off the work automatically on another station. Or if I start the assembly order, please also start the work on the engine line, on a complete different line, for instance. Eh? So. There are so-called pro process triggers that will eliminate the manual work or scanner work or uh, other job work, but that will, based on uh, the completion of a line station or the planning of a line station or the start of an order or the freeze of an order, uh, that we can kick off the work on other stations, like requesting the other station to start or automatically print uh, or display the work instructions on another station. or replenish a shop floor warehouse. Uh, that can be all automated with process uh, triggers.
when I say replenish the shop floor warehouse, you need to understand that every line station in the assembly line, uh, every uh, every line station need to be linked, uh, is a mandatory link to a shop floor warehouse. Uh, we don't call it assembly line warehouse, we call it shop floor warehouse, that's a pity, but that's just how the name is. Uh, so every line station has its own shop floor warehouse or uh, or a group of line stations are linked to the same shop floor warehouse, however you want to model that. Uh, and those warehouses are being replenished from the raw material warehouse uh, or from a supplier. Uh, we got different ways of replenishing uh, those shop floor warehouses or the assembly line. Uh, we can uh, uh, supply in line sequence, uh, so um, exhaust systems like the exhaust pipe, uh, every uh, uh, Every car, uh, every every engine needs a specific exhaust system. So exhaust systems, for instance, are supplied in in the sequence uh, of the cars on the assembly line. Uh, the same thing goes for uh, I've seen situations where the seats, the, the seats of the car, are being replenished uh, by a supplier in the line uh, in sequence. Some other things are being supplied with Kanban. Uh, I mean, some anonymous parts uh, that 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 are not that specific, uh, can be replenished by Kanban, empty bin for full bin. Uh, so we got uh, 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 different uh, time phase order points, uh, uh, Kanban, uh, supply and line sequence, uh, 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 so there are different ways of replenishing the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the assembly line. Good. Um, with that, uh, although I uh, did not intend to do a training and I just wanted to do a high level overview, but I think I maybe went sometimes a little bit too deep. Uh, with this, I hope I have given you an, uh, an, an impression of the EAPL and uh, assembly control uh, functionality. Um, yeah, so with this, I hope that I've uh, uh, given you an update on. Uh, on uh, on the, on the beautiful EAPLN uh, assembly control functionality. I see a lot of people in the call, by the way, who, uh, who already know uh, 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 assembly control, uh, who are implementing assembly control as we speak. So I can only hope that uh, I did not uh, disappoint uh, them uh, <laughs> as well. Um, I would like to ask, uh, are there questions uh, uh, about my presentation so far? Uh, the, the, the person who has a question uh, can uh, can unmute himself, I think, and uh, can ask a question. But then again, if there are no questions, um, I will send everybody this presentation. I will send everybody this presentation, and in case there are questions in a later moment, uh, always feel free to uh, call uh, or email me and uh, I, I will always be there to help out. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for, uh, 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 for listening to this uh, presentation. And if there's anything we can do for you, Swapnil will reach out uh, to all of you to see if there's anything uh, that we uh, can do for you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you.